Let us start um, today's webinar. Good afternoon for those of you, um, or maybe even evening for those of you in, in Asia, afternoon in Europe, and good morning to those in the Americas. Uh, welcome to this uh, global uh, webinar uh, led by BDO uh, team here in the UK, but of course we are uh, a global business and we uh, are very happy uh, that we have a global audience today. Um, so uh, my colleague um, Sharon uh, Tefil is in control of the slides and so I will just ask her to move to slide number uh, two. And that is me, I'm the head of global payroll um, based here out of the UK, uh, but very much looking across all 164 countries in which BDO um, has uh, presence. And, um, and a BDO, and this isn't a sales, a sales pitch, but it is um, for those who um, are not familiar with BDO and we're conscious that um, some people might not be, um, we are a full service business. And so, uh, and, you know, so we are able to offer not just payroll, although clearly that is in, in my heart and indeed in, in um, uh, my colleagues' hearts, but also the very complementary services uh, that you may need as an employer, that your employees may need or indeed the employing entities um, under which uh, you run uh, payroll operations. So BDO has invested over many, many years in all of those um, specialist skills and developed real subject matter expertise. I'm joined today by two subject matter experts. So uh, if you could go to the next slide, please, Sharon. Uh, so my colleague, Sharon Tayfield, um, who runs our global payroll operations um, and uh, that um, networking uh, right across all of the BDO teams right across the world to make sure that we can deliver that consistently exceptional global payroll that we wish to. And then one of many subject matter experts, uh, I'm delighted to uh, introduce you to Vicky Bright, um, who is being, has um, uh, focused very much on share plans and incentives. And today we'll be particularly talking the detail uh, about RSUs and stock options. And Sharon will be taking us through the impact that that then has um, on the broader payroll. So without further ado, um, I, shall, um, I shall hand over to them and look forward to seeing, seeing you at the end of the webinar um, where we will be able to take um, questions as, um, uh, on any of the topics um, that we discussed today. Thank you very much. Over to you, Sharon. Thank you very much, Ashley. Uh, and just on, on from my side, welcome everybody, and I hope that you will enjoy the time that you're going to spend with us. So a little bit about myself. My name is Sharon Tayfield. As Ashley said, I'm one of the directors in Global Payroll Services. I've worked in the outsourcing business for longer than I care to admit on camera, um, and I have spent a large portion of that within Global Payroll. Um, recently, I have worked uh, with the GPMI, and I'm part of their network as well. So just turning then to Vic Vicky, who is one of our directors within the Share Plans and Incentives, and I'll allow her to give you her background uh, before we kick off the session. So over to you, Vicky. Perfect, thanks, Sharon. Um, so as Sharon mentioned, um, I'm Vicky Bright. Um, you'll see my contact details as Victoria Bright because that's my email and it's just so much easier. Um, but I specialize in share plans and incentives. Um, that's everything from the design, the implementation, the administration. Um, and in particular, I have a specialism when it comes to international share plans. So working with colleagues in, um, I didn't realize we're up to 164 countries. So thanks Ashley for reminding me of that. Um, I'm not sure I work in all of them, but in a majority. Um, so we, yes, yeah, so I work with my equity colleagues to deliver and implement share plans um, in a wide range of jurisdictions. Thanks. Thanks. So if you've got any questions, just as a reminder, please put them in the Q&A uh, function or at the bottom of the screen and we will try and cover those off at the end of our session. It's going to be a bit of a talk through session. So we're just going to look at um, some key points that we thought would, we should cover as a starting point, and it's going to be very conversational. So obviously there is a need to focus on rewards at the moment. You only need to look at the annual financial statements of any large listed company, or in fact any company, to see that employer costs or employee costs and the benefits of having a workforce forms one of the largest expenses in the annual financial statements. Now more than ever, the need to attract and retain staff is critical. 
there's a huge skills shortage and it means that it's an employee's market. So employers are also having to align earnings across regions and countries. Vicky, is there anything that you'd like to specifically um, mention about workforce alignment? Um, yes, I think one of the key things, particularly if we're talking about private companies here, is being able to align employees to shareholders. Um, so that's, you know, if the company is aiming for an IPO or, you know, some type of exit event, um, share plans in particular, can, you can save cash and align people for the longer term. Um, so it really depends on the company, but I think alignment is key in particular for private companies. Thanks. So as we focus on rewards, we need to highlight that there's participant expense experience is very important. There needs to be a transparency around salaries and benefits, and the value of rewards needs to be that needs to be provided to the employee. That needs to be provided in a very simple way so that the employee has a clear understanding of what their total package is. With salary and benefits forming such a large percentage of the overall cost of any employer, it's really important that the appropriate risk mitigation policy is put in place and that that policy needs to address both the regulations covering tax reporting, but also payroll reporting. Many organizations turn to deferred compensations um, as a way of either attracting, retaining staff, but also to help with the cash flow of an organization and to help support retaining staff. You often hear the term uh, getting somebody for a long term buy in. So as we look at all these terms, it can be very daunting for a, a payroll professional to see all these names. Vicky, what would you uh, offer payrollers as they look at this landscape? Um, anything that you'd like to specifically point out? Um, yes, I think the key here is really um, internal communication for companies. So when companies implement a share plan, um, it might be, say, the tax team who's taken the appropriate tax advice, um, maybe with HR or the internal legal teams, um, but making sure that all of that information has disseminated down to what practically is the payroll obligations is key. Um, in share plans, we have lots and lots of acronyms for different types of plans. Uh, we haven't put them all on here, but you might see, you know, a, a payroll professional could see LTIP gains, um, NQSOs, the non-qualified <laughs> stock options. You could see ESPP, RSU, PRSU. Um, I could go on, but ultimately it boils down to, um, is a plan a cash plan? Is it a share plan or is it some type of option? And all of those types of plans have different taxing points. So any advice that companies have received internally in the tax team really needs to be disseminated to the payroll team. Thanks, I totally agree with that. So we've covered that there's a necessity for retraining, for attaining and attracting staff. But how does the current environment in which we find ourselves impact the rewards? Well, we've seen that there's a trend towards equity awards being granted, uh, and these are becoming more complex in terms of variations and features. And we only had to listen to the number of different acronyms that are given to them to see that it is a very complex um, environment in which we're operating. So to operate in the world in which we have a globally mobile workforce is also a new normal. We've got long-term and short-term uh, business trips, and we've also got both domestic and international staff movement. On top of that, global tax authorities are needing to recoup funds that they dispersed during the period of COVID to support employees and employers. And one way to fund the shortfall is to increase the efforts and focus on tax compliance and reporting, both at payroll and corporate tax levels. Non-compliance often leads to penalties. Um, and with that, there's obviously a cost associated. Those penalties can both be from tax and regulatory actions as they seek to enforce compliance. 
We've also got complex global tax regulations, which cannot be effectively managed without process controls and the correct governance being put in place. We've also briefly mentioned that tax compliance uh, is a corporate risk. That can be both monetary, but I think even more important is brand reputation. There's an increase in the name and shame practices. And that means that payroll professionals need to be raising the corporate risk at board level. Vicky, what do you, would you agree with that? And are there any points that you would like to mean, to add to this? Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything, um, everything on this list. I think what I see when I, when I look at um, companies in particular, globally mobile workforces, there's a real um, lack of understanding around internationally mobile employees. They are very complex in terms of, uh, you know, what employment contracts are they on? Where have they been? How are companies keeping up with where employees have been over the last few years? And also just um, a lack of awareness around, you know, your point in red there at the end, which is trailing liabilities and, and being able to kind of keep up with that. So if one person moves from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, um, having tax and reporting obligations in multiple places, um, and again, going back to the internal communication, is everything working together in terms of the HR, the tax, the legal, um, and ultimately the payroll, because the payroll is where somebody's going to have to operate those withholding requirements. Yep, definitely. And obviously, we've put the trailing liabilities in red there for, for a very good reason. Um, this is something that I'm coming across very frequently uh, as I do global payroll. And that, as you said, already mentioned, is because we've got a very global workforce. So what do we normally see in, in this situation? Well, let's take an example. We've got employer A, and he starts off his employment contract based in the UK, where he's awarded a stock award. And whilst he's working in the UK, he, he gets that award. Then shortly afterwards, he's transferred to the company's operations in Germany. And while he's there, the vesting takes place. And ever the global traveler uh, wanting to explore new heights, he takes another move, apologies, he takes another move to um, France, where, he's, where, where the award is actually exercised. Now, this is something that we see regularly happening within global payroll. Vicky, what does employer A and his company need to take into consideration with regards to corporate reporting and tax withholding in order to ensure that they are both remaining compliant? Yeah. Um, so if we're assuming that this is, um, we're going to call it a NQSO or a you know, non-qualified stock option. Um, but in essence, when it comes to the payroll obligations, um, in most countries, you have to look at the life of an award. So that would be from the grant right the way through to the exercise. Um, and in effect, you'd be sourcing for the amount spent in each, um, in each jurisdiction. Um, what we typically see is that most companies will operate payroll or the withholding obligation where the employee is at exercise. Um, and this creates problems because, in effect, in the country of exercise, you are overpaying the tax obligation, which then, mm. you know, leaves the, the company and the employee potentially exposed in other jurisdictions where they've underpaid tax. Um, but, for example, in the UK, um, we have separate equity reporting. So the equity reporting in the UK would have um, reported a grant to this individual and then there would be kind of the in of the award, but no out of the award because you wouldn't be able to see where that option had been exercised. Um, this is by far, I think, the kind of the biggest problem area and HMRC is starting to recognize that in the UK by issuing in particular kind of employment related securities and specific ERS disclosures. 
um, which can then kind of knock on to wider PAYE and employer compliance reviews. Um, so in terms of how companies can kind of get ahead of this, um, I think the key things come back to um, taking the right tax advice so that you know what happens as people are moving to different jurisdictions. Uh, I mean, here we've looked at jurisdictions that have payroll obligations. Some countries don't have payroll obligations for equity. Um, so taking the right tax advice and then making sure internally everybody is aware, but also that the employee is aware, the point that you made earlier, Sharon, about mm -hmm. uh, making sure that the employee really understands if they've got any you know, personal tax obligations. Definitely a lot of pointers to consider, um, clearly from a global payroll perspective. Um, coupled with that, and Vicky, you already mentioned this previously, that there's a number of different employment arrangements. So not only have we got people that are globally mobile and people that have got these trailing liabilities, but we've also got different employment arrangements um, that are coming to the fall. And we've just put a few names uh, or a few of those arrangements on the screen. We're not going to cover each one in detail, um, but it's just to give you an idea that these are some of the things that you need to consider when you are processing uh, the, the payroll. So Vicky, anything on these or the different types of employment arrangements that you would like to pull out or any stories that you've got from any of your clients that you've been working with? I mean, and as you said, we've got, you know, we've got 10 on the screen, but I'm sure between everybody in this group, we could come up with another probably half a dozen, dozen addition, additional um, kind of worker arrangements. Um, and the key here is that the different types of arrangements really dictate kind of the reporting and the tax obligations. Uh, some things here wouldn't result in, say, payroll obligations, but you might have modified payroll obligations, you might have um, you know, personal tax obligations. So it's really taking the right, the right employment tax advice. So when we're working with clients, we work very closely with our employment tax team. Um, so the employment tax team would help to determine the status of the employment so that then we can really work out what are the tax obligations for that type of worker. Um, and then the same thing with you know, short term business visitors, for instance, um, are they covered under a short term business visitor agreement? Um, is there anything additional to do via payroll? So I think for each company, again, it's understanding how many different types of employment arrangements you have. Um, you know, taking a step back and, you know, it may be simpler to do permanent relocations in terms of the tax and reporting obligations. Um, but, you know, life is not simple. <laughs> so <laughs> companies will have multiple types of arrangements. Um, so it's just taking the correct advice um, and making sure if you're using, say, high level advice, there's lots of um, there's lots of free information available on, you know, the BDO website, other um, company websites around how to ta tax equity in certain jurisdictions. But most will be heavily caveated on the basis of this is for local employees. Um, so as soon as you bring international mobile employees into it, different type of working arrangements, then you really need to be taking specialist advice to make sure that you've got the right advice. Couldn't agree more with that. So then as we move, obviously we, we've been speaking a lot about all of these factors impacting payroll and causing challenges within the payroll. So there's many factors that we need to address and be aware of and ensure that we've got the correct strategies and process to control and to ensure that we implement them. So not only to actually have thought about them, but also to ensure that we are implementing them where possible. So, you know, some of the strategies that we need to put into play or some of the aspects that we need to cover range from the share settlement delivery, where is that 
Uh, and there's no specific order, I might add. We've just put them onto the screen. And there's no relevance of the color either. And just in case anybody thinks that we're highlighting the red as being the most important, it's not anything like that. I think one of the, th one of the aspects which is often overlooked is communication to employees regarding tax and policy implications. I think one of the areas that I see emerging is where you do have your globally mobile employee. It's very important that the employer shares with the employee what are the ramifications of moving from country A to B on his reward package. All too often an employee decides that he's going to accept a move to another country and the first month in which he gets his um, pay slip or his pay package and he opens it, he either is beaming from ear to ear because he's very pleasantly surprised or there's a look of shock and horror on his face as he realizes the cost involved in that move, be that from a tax cost or social security cost. So it's really key that payroll professionals First of all, seek advice, as Vicky's already alluded to, be that tax advice or employment uh, advice, but also then communicates that to employees. So they've got a very clear understanding of their tax obligations in the move that they're about to undertake. And I think payrollers also need to be aware of the payroll withholding requirements because sometimes that payroll withholding may not be fully aligned to tax reporting. Vicky, is it, you know, would you agree with that, that there is sometimes a difference between the way that it is processed in the payroll and the way that the tax authorities are expecting something to be reported? Yes, absolutely. So um, the UK is a, a prime example that we have additional equity reporting obligations. Um, so this is what we all traditionally call the Form 42, which hasn't been around since 2014, but we all call it the Form 42. It's now called the other annual return. Um, but in effect, the UK have a raft of reporting requirements that sit outside payroll. Um, a number of other jurisdictions have similar, so Ireland, Australia, Japan, um, but in effect, there's only a few jurisdictions that have additional equity reporting that's outside payroll, um, so it is something that can be quite easily overlooked, um, you know, particularly when you're putting in place a global share plan. Um, and you've taken advice, say, in your parent company where you set up the plan, um, it's just key to notice that there's nuances um, in, different, in different countries. Um, and like you said too earlier about the communicating to employees, you know, if an employee opens their pay slip and it's, and it's different to what they're expecting, the first person that's going to get the call is the payroll team. Definitely. So, <laughs> Yeah. Um. yeah. And I think the other thing just to pull out here is obviously the penalty and interest for non-compliance. And again, it comes back to understanding what exactly are the payroll reporting requirements and what are the tax reporting requirements. I think one of the things that we definitely see from a payroll perspective where penalties are levied onto an employer, it's generally because of the timing of when the reporting needs to take place. It's one thing recording it in the payroll, but as Vicky's already mentioned, there are tax reporting obligations as well that are often associated with rewards. And because those rewards don't happen on a regular basis, sometimes it is overlooked. So I think the planning aspect of it and making sure that you've got everything well documented and you know exactly when something needs to be reported is very important. Yeah. And I think taking, um, you know, having a robust system in place that looks at your share plans and what should be happening in each jurisdiction will have you in good stead if you find an error. Because ultimately, if you find an error in any jurisdiction and go proactively to disclose that error, you're in a much better negotiating position for any penalties 
And obviously, the sooner you find something that's wrong to correct it, you have less interest. Um, you know, we do a lot of disclosures in the UK and, you know, most of the time, the penalty position, when you're doing a voluntary disclosure, um, in effect, ends up at zero because you've you've gone proactively to the revenue, you've taken reasonable steps and, you know, you might have a suspended penalty, but ultimately you can likely get into the position of zero penalties. If HMRC um, finds something, then you're on the back foot and you're in a different penalty bracket. So really it's about having, um, going back to your kind of point on an earlier slide, the robust processes in place. Definitely. And as you say, if you proactively reach out to revenue authorities, they generally will not impose any further um, punitive measures. So long as you've made, you've remedied the situation, you've got a plan in place to ensure that moving forward, you will have the right process in place um, and that you're going to re report things correctly. Yeah, exactly. And I think a lot of people, um, a lot of the revenues are now really looking at the process, the, the processes. So previously, you know, you might have said, you know, somebody's left, we miss this and, and we're going to do it better going forward. Um, but now actually you're producing evidence in terms of these are our new policy documents. These are the steps we have in place and everything is much more formal. Um, but I think, you know, revenues around the world want to see that you have something robust in place, not just an I'm sorry, I won't do it again type scenario. Definitely. So why, you know, we've, we've spoken about all these challenges, but why address mobility and rewards at this point in time? Uh, we've been speaking about the timeliness of payroll uh, and tax deposits, obviously that there's penalties and there's interest for non-compliance. And receiving those penalties or that interest for non-compliance is just going to add costs and is going to result in a higher cost onto your annual financial statement. So it's really important that as a payroll team, you understand and you address the mobility and the rewards and you act now before you put in place um, any reward scheme. So be prepared, make sure that you've got everything correct. And then in terms of the tax legislation, tax legislation is changing at an alarming rate. Uh, we saw that during the COVID period where even in the UK, I think tax was changing every single week for furlough schemes. Um, and it's really important that as a payroll team, you have a process in place for receiving tax legislation updates. If you're running a global payroll, then make sure that if you don't have your in, an internal tax team, that you have some way of receiving tax legislation changes so that you're aware of them and you can make plans for them. And, you know, in terms of your mobility of your employees, we've seen that it's really important that you're able to track where your employees are and that that is correctly processed via the payroll, especially if you're operating payroll in multi uh, countries and if your employees are moving from one location to another. There's lots of legislation in different countries around number of days that people can be in a country. And so it's really key that you have a tool to track employees data, uh, at, but more importantly, that that data is updated correctly. Because I've also seen where a system is in place, but the employee doesn't update it until after the fact and sometimes that can result in a reporting issue because you only become aware that an employee was in a certain location four or five months after they've come back from that location. So again, it's key that that is kept up to date. And then your internal uh, policies need to cover tax as well so that you know when to address trailing liabilities. I think that's one of the issues that we've seen emerging where companies are not aware of the trailing liabilities uh, and companies need to drive the correct process to change policies and to minimize risk. And then, as we've already mentioned, the communication with the employees to, to support retention. 
Okay, have you got any examples of companies that have come to you to assist with providing a tax policy internally? Um, yes, absolutely. So um, I'm actually working with a client now who, by doing the other, or Form 42 as we'll call it, <laughs> so everyone's more familiar with that, um, we were talking, having a discussion about internationally mobile employees, um, and they were running, uh, operating the payroll based on where the individual was at the exercise or the, the vest for the RSUs. Um, so once we'd have a, had a conversation about the trailing liabilities, they did actually have kind of the internal tracking um, kind of for a different purpose, but it wasn't being applied in terms of how should the awards, the equity awards be taxed. So we're helping them put in a kind of a robust process. And it was, again, it was linking up the, the payroll teams in certain jurisdictions with their um, the head office in terms of their legal tax and the HR team, just to make sure that everybody was on the same page. Um, because I, I really think that is the key when it comes to some of the challenges that you can see in payroll. Actually, it's, it's been a communication issue. Um, certain teams are aware of individuals moving, but are not aware of the repercussions of those moves and who needs to be informed. Um, so yes, we, we help um, clients kind of write that, um, the policy. And then on the last point here about employees, I think there's nothing worse than an employee moving from one jurisdiction to the other and getting that first pay slip and thinking, wow, my option award is not as good as I thought it was because I've been taxed so much more. Or, um, or the other way, which is more of a problem for companies, is where individuals move into jurisdiction where there's no payroll withholding requirement and employees should have been self-assessing it, but the company has not informed the individuals that they had that self-assessment uh -huh. requirement um, because then it kind of puts everybody in an awkward situation when it comes to the company having to have that conversation with their employee maybe after their tax returns have been filed. That's a very valid point. Yeah. And I think it's one that's overlooked. So again, it just proves that it's really important that companies have, whether it's a fact sheet or whether it's an internal document that employees can go to, to, to see, first of all, what their reward will look like in different countries so that they can be informed about decisions that they're making, but also to assist them in terms of their own self-filing. Absolutely. And I think a lot of companies are really good when it comes to home employees in certain jurisdictions. You know, it's set out clearly in terms of these are our plan rules, these are your, you know, option agreements or RSU agreements. Um, this is what happens if you're an, an employee in France, this is how it's taxed. But the real difficulty comes when people are moving internationally um, and then really it becomes kind of a case by case basis. So there's a lot of wider considerations as well that one needs to look at, especially when it comes to um, to RSUs and to share. So Vicky, I know that this is your area of expertise. So do you want to just talk us through this? Yes, yes, sure. Um, and this, I think, is coming from taking a step back and saying, you know, if you don't have a share plan in place at the moment, um, what other things would you need to look at? You know, if you were starting with a blank sheet of paper and you're designing a share plan, um, you need to look at, you know, what are the shareholders um, goals for the company? What's your employee base like in terms of, um, you know, demographic? They might have different um, ideas when it comes to um, what's right for them, you know, cash-based plans, share-based plans. Um, but from a company perspective, putting in place kind of one design of an equity award and then rolling it out internationally, I would just say take some time to talk to equity, local equity experts um, or somebody who will coordinate that for you so that you're making sure the plan design reflects those different jurisdictions that you're in. Some jurisdictions are much harder than others to put equity plans in place. And it might be that in that jurisdiction, a cash plan is preferable. Um, it might be that in some jurisdictions, um, share plans are uncommon. 
and the employees would prefer the cash. Um, and then you've got the opposite. You know, in the US, it's very common to have uh, stock options and RSUs, and um, it's sort of unheard of to just see cash-based plans. So I think the plan design is key um, if you're kind of starting from scratch. But even if you have something in place, tweaks can be made to international share plans to really assist the employee, but also the company when it comes to optimization. So whether that's something that can be a, you know, a tax approved share plan. So in the UK, for example, you could have a company share option plan, which is very confusing because it sounds like it should just be a share option plan, but it's a very specific UK approved share plan that allows up to £30,000 worth of um, options to employees at capital gains tax rates. So that's something that can be kind of inserted as a sub plan under an international banner that is a really big benefit to the employee because you get a lower tax rate, but also for the company because then you're, um, you're not paying social security on those awards. Um, and there's a, a number of different jurisdictions that have certain social security benefits or tax exemptions, and that benefits both the employee and the employer. The same with recharge agreements and making sure that the benefits of the corporation tax deduction um, are being felt in the local countries. Again, I think everything is about small tweaks and taking the time to look at certain jurisdictions. And for many companies, that will be a kind of a cost benefit analysis in certain jurisdictions. Um, so generally, if I'm taking a step back and looking at a company and they may be in 20 or 30 jurisdictions, you may give high level advice in all of them and then say, we should focus on this 10 because most of your employee population with your actual awards is in, is in this 10, or these are the key areas where optimization and therefore tax and social security exemptions will apply. Um, so I think, and then we sort of mentioned the kind of the internal communication and making sure that you're in communication to employees is um, just to make sure they know what's happening as they're moving. Yeah. <laughs> and as you've already mentioned, you know, having that matrix available so that that it, definitely the global payroll team know exactly what needs to happen in different jurisdictions is really important mm -hmm. and having a refresh done ever so you know maybe annually or biannually maybe every two years is really important because legislation can have changed and at that point the employer has they can either decide to do gross up payments to cover some of the costs because that's also something that is emerging now with employers picking up some of the, the extra costs that have been passed on to employees, but allows them to proactively manage that and to make sure that they've got the right process in place or that they've given it some consideration. Yeah, absolutely. So we've now reached the, the, the point at which we can uh, address some of the questions that have been raised. And I know we've got one or two that have come in while we've been on the air. Um, so I'm not sure, if, Ashley, if you're going to read them to us or I can go and pick them up. Uh, so firstly, Sharon and, uh, and Vicky, thank you very, very much uh, for a really informative session. I, I actually really enjoy just sitting here and listening and learning. It's a, uh, and even though I have heard presentations on RSUs and other awards before, uh, there's always a new insight. And there is, uh, as um, Vicky and Sharon were saying, there is always something changing. So that was that was really good for me. Thank you very, very much. Uh, we do have the questions. I actually um, it, think it might be better, Sharon, if you host those um, okay. those, um on the grounds that, um, that you actually um, will have a greater chance of understanding the question as well as the answer. Um, <laughs> Not a problem. My expertise is running this business rather than, uh, rather than in, the, uh, in the detailed operations. So over to you. Okay, so Vicky, we've we've got, in fact, we've got a number of questions. So um, let's start off with one which goes right back to our trailing liability slide, um, because we've got somebody who sent in a question that says they've moved two times in the past 10 years with their company, but they are not sure that they were taxed 
in the third country, or that they may have been taxed only in the third country, is there something that they should be doing um, in order to ensure that they are actually fully tax disclosed in each of the regions? Okay, what would so your advice be there? Um, so it sounds like that's a question from an employee rather than yes. a company. Okay. Yes. Um, so what I would say in that situation is if they think they've been taxed 100% in the third country, um, they should definitely raise it with their employer, uh, but, you know, particularly if, mm. if they've been in three countries. Um, you know, from an employee perspective, they can probably take comfort in the fact that it sounds like they have been taxed somewhere, um, but it sounds like the company may have may have put it all through the third country, which may not be correct. Um, you know, without knowing what type of share award it was or what countries it's in, it's quite difficult to give kind of, you know, obviously personal tax advice. But I would say definitely they should raise it with their company. Um, and I'm happy if they want to get in touch directly after after the call um, and we can um, discuss that and I can get a bit more information about what type of plan they've been and what countries they've been in. Um, it might be that they were in a jurisdiction where, you know, there was no payroll reporting requirement mm -hmm. um, and actually they should have done something by via self-assessment, but the company hasn't told them. So I definitely think it's a conversation with their company and then a conversation with some, you know, professional advice. I'd say can that definitely go back to the employer first and just make sure because as you say it could be that one of the jurisdictions could have been a country in which there was no reporting required, in which case they can sigh a sigh of relief. Uh, nothing's wrong uh, and it's been done correct. Um, yeah. The next question is one I suppose it is, is aimed at myself, and that is what are the most difficult jurisdictions to operate payroll in? And I think linked to that, just that you don't feel left out, Vicky, it's um, what are the cumbersome locations for reporting tax and equity in? So if I go first, in terms of the uh, countries or global payroll where it is most complex, depends which uh, sort of research that you follow, because there's two big bodies of research at the moment. So if you look at the GPMI research, um, they list the, the following countries as being countries which are complex to operate payroll in. Brazil, Canada, China, France, Germany, UK, US and India. And we feature in that. Um, so those are the, the countries that they consider to be complex. Now, that research was for 2021. In the same period, an independent research was carried out, um, which had as its pool of uh, sort of respondents, largely European based organizations. No surprise then that the list did not include the UK and did not include the US, but the countries that came out there were France, Italy, Belgium, Germany, and Spain. So on the basis that you've got two sets of data, uh, the common countries are definitely France and Germany, if we're looking at Europe, um, and having listened to colleagues from the global environment, I would say that the US of A is a complex country in which to operate because each of the different um, areas has totally different reporting requirements. And Vicky, I think we can add in the UK, uh, I think it is a complex uh, country. So that would probably be my answer, would be the UK, US, France and Germany would be what, what I would consider the, the very top um, countries. And then obviously adding in Brazil, Canada and India, Belgium and Spain. Yeah, Does that I... relate to tax reporting? Um, sort of. This is an interesting question because I think this question was submitted in advance on Friday, so I have been mulling it over the weekend. Um, it's We're always told that the UK is complex when it comes to equity, and I think that's probably because we've got quite a lot of different approved share plans, um, and we have obviously the separate equity reporting obligation. Um, and we're probably very hot on trailing liabilities. So it probably does make the UK quite complex. Um, for, 
you know, as a UK advisor and sitting in the UK, whenever I work with other jurisdictions, um, you know, China, I find it quite complicated when it comes to equity. They've got some very specific rules. Um, and really, we've only started doing equity in China because actually it was just cash plans was the simpler option. Um, they also have some interesting automatic withholding taxes applied, um, which doesn't seem to align with the double tax treaty. Um, so I'd say China is quite complicated. Um, I had a call with Lebanon this morning, which now turns out to be on my very complicated list because they've got no um, kind of share plan legislation. So everything you ask has to go through the Ministry of Finance. Um, you know, it's a really difficult kind of troublesome country at the moment in terms of what's going on and the high inflation. So it makes, providing a definitive answer quite difficult. Um, but yes, I'd say the US is quite complex because you've got kind of the, the you know, the state and the federal. Um, but yes, I, yeah, so I'd go US, UK, uh, China, and then this morning I have added Lebanon. Uh, France, I would agree with because they've got multiple um, approved share plans. And actually, their RSU share plan approval, um, you have about three or four in different years. So you've got three or four different versions of the same plan, which is complicated. So hopefully that answers their question. <laughs> if not, they can drop us an email, as you've said, our, our contact details are on there. We have another question that came in this morning, and that was uh, from somebody who said, I understand the company needs to withhold taxes from employees upon exercise of option or vesting of RSUs. Should this be done before issuing the shares to employees, or is it fine as long as it is remitted within the tax year? Okay, so um, you, it's simpler. So the, the, the simpler option is to say somebody is exercising their option and the company's plan rules will say, have a nice withholding clause that says, when you come to exercise your option, we will automatically for you withhold X. Um, and, you know, different companies will set that, but in most cases, you know, pragmatically companies will choose, say the highest tax rate or an appropriate tax rate in each jurisdiction, um, which just means that it's simpler for the company. So you operate withholding, um, you deliver them either, if we take the UK, for example, you have hundred shares, um, your plan rules dictate that you're gonna withhold um, at 45%. So 45 of the shares are immediately sold and that the cash for 45 is given to the payroll to operate the payroll and the 55 shares are delivered to their broker account. Um, that is the simplest solution. Um, it, you don't have to do it that way. You can say, you know, the employee receives all 100 shares and then they owe the company the money. Um, that sometimes leads into difficulties if the employee does not have the money to pay it back and then you enter into uh, loan conversations or if the employee has not made good by the 6th of July following the end of the tax year you can have an additional section 222 tax um, so it just gets more and more challenging so typically I would say the simplest method is to withhold as somebody is exercising I think that confers with what I've seen or, you know, in, in all the years I've been doing global payroll, I'd say 90% of the organisations I've worked with have gone for that settlement approach where the company has a broker that sells some of the shares to cover the cost of the tax. And as you've said, in, in some company situations, they decide on the maximum tax rate that is in operation um, to ensure that the correct amount of taxes is withheld. And then if there is, you know, a refund that is due, they will reimburse the employee. So once it goes through the payroll and they look at the net situation, if it is that they've with that they've sold too many shares to cover the cost of the tax, they would just refund to the employee. So there'd be a settlement 
uh, when the payroll is run. But that definitely seems to be the approach that most companies would take. So I would agree with that. Uh, there is a part B to that question. Uh, so that was part A. Part B is um, in a vesting of RSU, if it coincides with a blackout period, can the employee sell shares during the blackout period to cover the cost of the taxes? Um, so usually, because it's kind of under an employee share scheme, yes. Um, because, for instance, our, the vesting of RSUs, um, there's nothing, there's no control. Uh, the employee has no control over when they vest. Um, so that's just an automatic vesting schedule, whether that's uh, quarterly or annual. Um, so, yes, usually, yes. Um, their plan rules might state something else that the vest moves, um, but typically, yes. We have another question that's just come in. I think we might have to make this our last um, question given the, the, the time that we've got, but we'll see how quickly we can answer it. So this question says, um, if the company is not public yet, but either uh, options or RSUs have been awarded to employees. These options or RSUs have been vesting for the employees in their share works account. The options or RSUs have not fully vested as the company is still private. Once the company goes public, all options or RSUs will vest. If an employee has worked for several entities within the same company, do the options or RSUs need to vest on the payrolls where the employee has been working or can they all vest in the entity they work in when the company goes public? So I'm thinking this is a little bit, this is quite a complex question and it's pulling in some of our trailing liabilities plus a change in the overarching structure of an organization yes i mean it's um it's a multi-faceted question um and it would be interesting to know whether or not that's working for the same company but in different jurisdictions um and in that case you'd need to look at so you know working in the different jurisdictions but also how are the rsu's um, and the options structured, because are they structured that they only vest on that exit or the IPO, or are they structured that they're kind of earned over the life of the award? So, you know, if they had just moved, say, in, you know, in between UK entities, um, then ultimately, you know, the UK authority would be um, you know, receiving the tax. Um, so I would see that as less problematic if you've got lots of different jurisdictions involved, um, then I'd say we'd probably have to, or somebody has to look at the plan rules and also to look at kind of where things have been earned. Yeah. So it really comes down to the vest point. I agree with you. There, there's not enough in here for us to fully answer because we're not sure whether it's in the same jurisdiction or whether it's across jurisdictions. Um, and I think you would also need to consider the move from a private company to, to a public company. What impact has that got as well? So there's well, exactly. layers. And, <laughs> yeah, and, typic and again, high level, uh, generally speaking, if your, your company is private, then you know you've it's kind of a personal tax obligation to to settle your tax but um you know once a company goes public and actually in the uk we've got sorry are we running over in the uk we've got you know a concept of readily convertible assets and that doesn't kick in on the day you you know ipo actually it's a kind of a moving process and you have to look at when does the payroll obligation kick in um, it's not the date you list, it might be as early as the date you appoint brokers or the date you are intending to list. So the obligation between 
um, is this a private tax return matter or is it a company payroll obligation? You know, a lot of companies need advice around the time of IPO in terms of what to do with their share plans. Definitely. So I think that's definitely a question whoever um, submitted that. If you'd like any advice, then please do drop us an email and we can get in contact with you. But I think that um, question pulls us to the conclusion. So Ashley, over to you. But Vicky, thank you very much for chatting with me about this uh, topic. I'm sure we could have gone on for a very long time, but it's been very enjoyment. <laughs> yes, thank you. Sharon, Vicky, thank you both very much. Um, so concluding remarks, very, very simple. Um, and that last question and the answer really bring it to bear. The devil is in the detail. Even something that sounds superficially straightforward, the question could have been half as complex, but still the devil will be in the detail. So um, that is the danger. And it also things are changing so fast that advice you may have received previously um, could well be out of date. Um, so that, um, that devil is, um, is a shifty chappy um, and, um, and needs to be chased and it needs to be current research. So um, that's, that's great. And, that, um, and as I say, I thoroughly enjoy listening to these, um, to these events. Uh, and my second uh, message is just to say, please do contact us um, through either the original invitation or through these email details, which you may have written down already. They will be published uh, along with the whole of this um, uh, slide pack and a recording, um, and you'll be notified when that publication um, has taken place. My, um, my colleague um, will, one of my other colleagues will post that. Um, but with, um, with two minutes to go, um, I thank you all for uh, for joining us. Uh, and I thank you particularly to those who sent in questions in advance and during the session. Uh, it's, um, it's been a pleasure to deliver. I trust you enjoyed watching it and um, farewell and, um, and tread carefully on the, uh, uh, the tricky path of RSUs and share options. Thank you all very much. Thank you.